My name is Dr. Gary L. White. I am a licensed social worker and family therapist. Um, I'm also an instructor. I teach um, social work courses at the University of Georgia. Um, and I part of an organization called Let Us Make Man, a gathering to reclaim black manhood, where um, I specialize to do all the uh, workshops on restoring the black family and making the modern family work. Um, it was really sparked right after the Million Man March. Um, it came back to my agency at the time and they weren't feeling the issue of fatherhood. And I was a new dad uh, with my wife for 22 years, but I was a new dad. And what really kicked it off is when my daughter was born um, at the hospital. Um, uh, they had all the paperwork for my wife to fill out. And, um, you know, the, the put the fingerprint uh, in my wife's fingerprint and then the daughter's fingerprint. And I wanted to write my name everywhere my wife did. And they said that was not necessary. And I said it was necessary. And then they took my daughter's foot and they put it on that little thing and they had my wife's name. So everywhere my wife put her name uh, on the birth records was my name. Um, that became such, so problematic that the hospital administrator came in. Um, and it was there, believe it or not, in that little moment on uh, February 16, 1994, um, they gave birth to um, uh, recognizing that fathers, particularly African-American fathers, should not be marginalized and should be literally at the center. So that sparked much of my work um, around fatherhood. The biggest issue I wanted to tackle was the misnomer and the failed beliefs they had about African-American fathers. Um, this period of time, 94 and 95, is when the notion or the concept of dead be dads became popular. Uh, it became popular like a rap. Everybody was saying it, even though it was not well defined. Um, so for me, um, in hearing that and understanding that, that kind of kicked it on, uh, kicked it forward for me, saying that this is not the paradigm of African-American men. And so what kicked it off for me is when I started doing my research and, and teaching, um, um, that was my calling. So everything I did evolved around understanding unwed fathers. It went to the next level when I started doing the research in Georgia and finding out that fathers didn't have rights. So it gave birth to the miseducation of African-American fathers um, and the argument. So that, that's really what moved my work in this area. Well, um, at a couple levels, I, I think the research misinforms the issue on one hand in terms of, one, how they define uh, what a responsible father is. Um, particularly for African-American men, I think research misses it because research has this white Western view of, of fatherhood. It's, he's exclusively, exclusively defined by his, his ability to meet the financial needs of the children. And that's the single dimension that drives what um, in society it, under, it, it defines to be a responsible father. Well, the problem with that is historically African-American men have been the last hired and the first fired. Um, uh, African-American men have always led the unemployment rate, so therefore if a man's financial ability is a single determinant of responsible fatherhood, then structurally speaking, it is impossible for him to be the father that he should be. So therefore, the the opposite side of that, which is the work that you're going to hear Andrew Billingsley and Wade Nobles and Naeem Akbar and Jawanza Kunjufu, you hear them talk about is understanding what it means for African American fathers, that physical involvement part, the, the namesake aspect of it, understanding the importance of the ritual of getting your hair cut for the first time. These are elements and dimensions that are not considered. I think the other gap in the research where they miss it is understanding that a father not in the home does not take under the consideration his proximity to the home. And so if we just defined um, um, father involvement as present in the home versus absent from the home, then we have a, we again have missed the mark. And you'll see a lot of research that talks about women, are, the number of children that are being raised in single parent female headed households, and all the research that talks about the absent fathers, but they don't make a distinction concerning his proximity to the home. And I talk about that in my dissertation as well.
I think um, the potential for it is, uh, is an awakening. And it's a realization that we have historically been powerful. And I think we've just historically forgotten how powerful we are. And the awakening of it is changing the paradigm in terms of the way we think and understand our fathers. It, it's changing the attitudes and the beliefs. So the potential for a fatherhood movement is um, an opportunity to, um, 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 to forge together or re-strengthen or reconnect um, um, lost relationships. You know, we talk about slavery all the time and the absence and what slavery did in separating the families, but what people don't realize is um, towards the end of the Civil War, men immediately following the freedom, they began to travel from plantation to plantation to find their families. And so imagine the power of the fatherhood movement where we then have men, once we've achieved it, start going from project to project or community to community, just as they put, the, just as our ancestors put those children on the horses and their families on the horses. Imagine, I don't care if they're getting on the martyr, I don't care if they're getting on the train, I don't care if they're getting on the bus, but the power of this movement it's gonna result in men reconnecting and building those relationships with their mothers. And their challenge, of course, is in many regards, um, dealing with a structure or a system that does not have faith or a structure or a system that has defined what father involvement is to be like. And, and that's a big challenge that we have.